Welcome to this first guest lecture in STAT 447. I'm beyond thrilled to have with us uh, Dr. Sandra Saltstedt, who uh, not that long ago joined The Economist as a senior data journalist and has done uh, most excellent work I've uh, sometimes shared on social media too. And so somehow we started talking and I um, uh, thought I could be outrageous and ask him to come and talk to us. And he was kind and brave enough to agree to that. Um, so uh, I put a little bit about bio of Sandra uh, on the on the webpage. There's no point sort of repeating all of that. I think I'll just cede the uh, floor to him. And once again, welcome and thank him profusely for doing this for us. So this is the first. We're actually doing something live rather than asynchronously pre-recorded. So he is a guest lecturer on data journalism at The Economist. The floor is yours, Sandra. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, my intention for this session is for it to be as useful as possible to, to you in the audience. Um, so uh, what I'm going to be talking about today is data journalism at The Economist. Um, I would like to structure this talk into a few parts. Um, in the first part, I will be talking uh, about covering the pandemic as a data journalist, uh, what that's been like, going into some detail on some of the projects that we've we've done um, at our publication. And then in the latter half, I would try to suggest a few ways in which the techniques and, and tools that you are uh, gaining familiarity with as part of your course can be useful, uh, either you know, in data journalism or, or just generally, um, and offer some suggestions for ways to approach um, data and, and thinking about data uh, moving forward. All that said, I think it's useful for this to be uh, done, as they call it, econ style, which means if you have a question, then try to raise your hand or, or you know, maybe, maybe even unmute yourself and interrupt me if you would like. Um, and if you don't do that, then I'm going to assume that everything is perfectly clear and just move on. So all that said, um, first, I would like to introduce the Economist data team. Um, so at The Economist, we have been doing data journalism since 1843. Um, this is from, I think, our very first issue where we're looking at things like earthenware and linen manufacturers exported to the United States from Britain. Um, and we never really stopped. So um, our publication is um, a lot about numbers and all our journalists use data all the time in their work. Uh, nevertheless, we have a dedicated data team. Um, and that team is dedicated to um, what you might call uh, visual data journalism, where we use data and counting and quantitative analysis as the bulk of our um, work, uh, bulk of our articles, bulk of our contributions. So um, today we, we have quite a large team, I would say. Um, you see all the pictures on, on the screen right now. I, I won't go into all the names. Um, but generally, there is a divide within our data team between the people doing um, analysis and writing, which are the data journalists, which are on the left side, and the people responsible for producing the visuals, um, who are on the right side. That said, um, the people on the left do visuals and the people on the right do analysis. But we have found this a useful way to sort of divide up the labor um, in that the people doing visualizations can focus on getting that perfectly right. Um, while the people doing the writing and analysis part can focus solely on projects for long periods of time uh, and then get together with the visualizer once the findings are clear and, and we're ready to move to publication. So uh, I would like to start with um, a brief foray into our work on mobility. Um, and the reason I would like to do that is just to show how the links between um, journalism and working at large companies like Google um, and doing public policy are, are a bit more fluid than, than one might think. Um, so when the pandemic got underway, um, one of the first things people noticed was that people stayed at home, um, even if some in many places they were compelled to do so by their governments, but in other places they simply did so because they were afraid of this uh, quite deadly disease. So this is a picture from Liverpool Street Station, which normally is, is quite busy. This is a major station in London. Um, and this is a picture from Grand Central Station um, taken before the pandemic, of course, way more busy. Um, but even Grand Central Station varies in how busy it is. So this is another picture taken from the same angle where you see there's a lot more people. 
Now, one lunch when the pandemic was still mainly contained to China and with limited outbreak, we thought at the time, or many thought at the time in Italy, um, we had the idea that wouldn't it be great if we could know if people were staying at home or not, just based on data that was publicly available already. So James Frenchman, a colleague of mine, um, and I, we uh, sat down and, and started thinking about how we could do this. And one thing that he suggested was, well, Google tends to measure this, right? Because they will tell you if a place is as busy as it usually is, or not too busy, or, or even you know, more busy than, than usual. And that data is available publicly. So naturally, um, what we did was first uh, to see if it could be downloaded directly in bulk. Um, that turned out to be impossible. So we went to the API and, and looked to see if, if, if there were any, any solutions that, that could get us there. Um, and the next thing we did was to contact Google directly. So we sent them an email asking, you know, this is an important public health emergency. Um, could you please share the data with us? Um, unfortunately, we didn't hear back um, and uh, they, seemed to be unwilling to, to give us the data directly. What we decided to do then was, of course, to mimic human behavior in a way and um, simply write a script to visit this API tens and thousands of times. Um, now, this involves a lot of coding. Uh, so Evan and James Fransham, or I forgot his last name, but our, my colleague Evan and, and James, um, they went through um, the API, learned how it worked, set up a script, and started querying it. Um, and after, you know, thousands of lines of code later, we ended up with a folder of over 800,000 observations of this API. Now, what you get once you've queried it enough times is data that looks like this, um, which will say things like not too busy, a little busy, give it a time name and have a unique ID. This is not enough for a data story. We couldn't just print this. So we needed to process it further. Um, and that involves, of course, even more code. And that turned into something that is a bit more manageable, a large data frame with, at this point, yes, 812,000 observations from places like New York City, where we now have Grand Central Station showing that it was indeed less busy than usual or not too busy or not busy at all. So um, what do we do with this? Well, we decided to first look at the data and see if there were any patterns just apparent from, from a simple visualization. Um, what we found was that, strangely, Sydney seemed more busy than usual, perhaps because of um, this being in the summer there, whereas most cities, especially in Italy, were way less busy. Um, and eventually what we, what we decided to do was to zero in on Rome um, as a city, uh, and producing this article, which first had a bunch of different countries and then looked within Rome at the different subway stations at which were way less busy than usual and which were more busy than usual. Um, this was of course, you know, a print publication. We were, we were happy with it, but the story didn't really end there. So a few weeks later, uh, the CEO of Google um, decided to make all this data public um, in easily digestible format. So at first it was only as PDFs, I should say. So not easily digestible at first. First it was PDFs, which are impossible, well, not impossible, but very hard to process. Um, and then eventually as this um, CSV files that you can now download. Um, and they are the basis for not just journalists looking into whether people move around, but also what governments are doing. When they are measuring how well people respond to the pandemic, many of them use data like this. So we saw that as, as a very worthwhile um, byproduct of our effort. Now, of course, I should I can't really say by product because I don't know Google's motivations, but um, at least it is conceivable that they were inspired by the effort that we um, we uh, did um, to produce our piece. So, um, with all this data, you can you can now look you know within subunits of countries. So this is the granularity of the data within the UK, um, and you can do look at within different categories. So you have you know general trips, you have bars, restaurant and shopping, places of work and so on and so forth. And we have used this in future analysis to look at the effect of lockdowns and which reduction of mobility and which categories were most effective in reducing the spread of COVID-19 within the UK. So uh, and there's also now a bunch of other um, sources for this data. You have you have Apple, you have TomTom, you have CityMapper and, and so on and so forth. So this really took off. Um, now, the second uh, 
project I want to talk about uh, is, I think, worth mentioning for a somewhat different reason, and that is because this is uh, one of the more ambitious modeling efforts that we have uh, undertaken, um, perhaps, well, certainly in, in my time uh, at The Economist. So um, the question um, is quite simple. How many people have died because of the pandemic? Now, anyone can go on the John Hopkins website and see a number close to 5 million people. Um, but of course, um, that is not an accurate number. So as I hope most of you know, uh, COVID-19 cases don't accurately count COVID-19 infections and COVID-19 deaths don't reflect the number of people who have died because of the pandemic. Uh, and the reason is quite simple. Even in rich countries, there is a mismatch between the two because testing is limited and record uh, keeping also. But especially in poor countries, they simply cannot afford to test people and they do not have the resources um, that you need for accurate record keeping. That means that official case and death counts are wrong and they are wrong in a very nefarious way, which is that they tend to underestimate the severity of the pandemic in the countries with the least resources to fight it. So you might ask, well, are we talking about a 20% undercount, 30% undercount, maybe even 50% undercount? Um, and I'll tell you that you probably shouldn't be thinking in percentages, rather you should be thinking in multipliers. So to give just two examples, um, six months into the pandemic, we looked at zero positivity data, which is surveys of people and how many antibodies they have, or the proportion of people with antibodies to COVID-19, suggesting they had been infected in the past. Such analysis suggested that in Nigeria, only one in 1,500 infections were counted. So that is a multiplier of 1,500 of official case counts to get an accurate true tally of past infections. And that becomes more conceivable when you think about the fact that even today, the country has tested about 3 million people in total. The UK, meanwhile, which has a much smaller population, tests 7 million people every week. Um, so you can just imagine which country is going to log more cases. With regards to deaths, um, you could look to Khartoum, as some researchers did very early on. Um, what they found was that the official death toll there was about 1% to 2% of the deaths due to the pandemic. So for every 100 deaths, only one or two are counted. Now, what we tried to do very early on was to try to gain some sense of the number of infections worldwide. Um, and to do so, we collected a bunch of uh, zero surveys uh, I made an estimate of, of how many people had actually been infected worldwide. What we found back in September of 2020 was about 620 million people likely having had COVID-19. That made for a multiplier of about 20 at the global level. Um, that might sound outrageous, but uh, just two weeks later, the World Health Organization would come out with, with a similar multiplier, essentially saying that our estimate had been um, in line with theirs. Now, the question that we tackled in this project um, was deaths in particular. And what we tried to answer was, what is the true death toll of the pandemic? Um, now, the way we elected to define this was um, quite, I would say, uh, methodologically founded in the sense that we are looking at the uh, potential outcomes of a pandemic or not a pandemic. So this is called the neyman rubin causal model. Um, and essentially what we're doing is we're taking all the deaths that occurred during the pandemic and then we're taking away all the deaths that would have occurred in the absence of one or we would expect in the absence of a pandemic. Now, for those of you who have followed uh, what The Economist has been up to, you will know that this means excess deaths. So that's observed versus deaths we expected to observe. In this chart behind, or in the chart, uh, on, the, on the slide, what you see is the total number of deaths in the United States in the past few years. So the gray lines are deaths in 2015 to 2019, and the black line, the average for those years. The red line, meanwhile, are deaths in 2020. Now, the difference between uh, essentially the black line and, and the red line are all the deaths that um, are in excess of what you would expect for 2020. And as you can see, there's quite a lot of them. We started looking at this uh, back in March of 2020 when we were notified by a local source in Northern Italy that the COVID-19 death counts appeared to be very inaccurate. Um, and essentially, um, it can be explained by, by the graph you see here. So the black line would be the expected deaths, whereas the, the, um, red, um, the red area 
is the COVID-19 deaths on top of the expected deaths. So if the COVID-19 deaths were accurate, then those should be all the deaths we would observe, but they were not. Uh, and the light red area are all the deaths that are in excess of previous years, but are not captured in official death tolls. So even in Northern Italy, the, one of the wealthier places in the world, you see the significant undercounting of, of the COVID-19 COVID uh, death toll. Um, similarly, El Pais, uh, a Spanish newspaper, did the same, and we were able to build on their work for, for that country. Um, and um, eventually, we decided that this was something we wanted to keep track of. So uh, my colleague, James Toaster, reached out to our global network of correspondents and asked them, is there total mortality data available for your country? Um, and with their help, we were able to build a tracking page with uh, data from uh, a ton of rich countries all over the world. Uh, I say rich countries because they are the ones who tend to uh, monitor this stuff in close to real time. Um, eventually, we managed to get data from more countries, including uh, South Africa um, and places in, in Southeast Asia. Now, uh, this takes a lot of coding to do. Um, and especially to keep it updated is a lot of work. So it involves, you know, um, every week going in and looking at all these sources and, and trying to, to automate the process as best as possible. Um, now, we wanted to share this with, with researchers um, because we understood that this was important. And so in May, we published all of it on GitHub. Um, this also helped our competitors, I should say, but we consider that worthwhile um, in the sense that um, sharing our work while in, in certain limited cases might you know, mean that other, get, other people get to something first, um, tends to be good for the field and they will pay it forward in the future. Um, and there is enough news for, for everyone, um, I would say. Um, this tracker proved to be a huge success in academia. So we, I think someone did the numbers and it has been cited several hundred times already. So a lot of people build on, on this work and that's something we're very happy um, that we were able to, um, um, to facilitate. Um, here you see close to the current form of this tracker, which shows um, excess deaths as a heat map with the darker red being more deaths than, than usual and um, the gray being uh, what you would expect in a normal year. Um, and as you can see for the very few countries uh, in developing countries where we have data, uh, it tends to be extremely severe and also um, less uh, granular. Um, so we only have monthly data for Peru, for instance, in, in this uh, visualization. Now, um, the problem with using excess deaths data as a measure of the toll of the pandemic is that it's simply not available for uh, a large chunk of countries. So on the map you see behind me is the data that we had available in May, 2020. Um, so all the white countries are countries where there is essentially no data on excess deaths. Uh, moreover, even for the countries you see on this map where there is some color, uh, it doesn't mean that we have data that is up to date. No country produces this on a daily basis um, and only the richest ones do so with uh, a couple of weeks lag. In most cases, you have to wait months before this data becomes available, making it an insufficient metric of what is going on. And obviously, when you don't have most of Africa, most of South Asia, most of Southeast Asia, a very incomplete uh, way to capture the toll of the pandemic worldwide. So um, what, we, what we were thinking was, well, we don't have excess deaths data, but we have a lot of other data. So we have data on tests per day, we have data on movement, we have data on the official death toll, flawless that metric is, we have data on the economy, on, on politics, on a test positivity rate, and so on and so forth. So essentially we end up with the situation um, where we have data that we can map to our outcome of interest. So in this case, excess deaths. Um, and then we have data that we can uh, map to no outcome of, of interest, um, which is, what we're, we're seeking, we're seeking this missing excess death data. So essentially, in a situation like this, and this is something that I believe will become more and more common in, in data journalism, what you need is a model. You need to find patterns between the data you have and the data that you would like to predict. Um, and then you need to use the data that you have to, to predict uh, the data that you have not. Um, now this opens up a question, which model to use? 
Um, and my, my general uh, approach to this is use the best model, which sounds silly, but essentially in many cases you can test. You can take some of your data, put it to one side, and then build a model on the rest, and then use the model that you have built uh, to predict on, on the sort of hel uh, holdout set. Um, using such a procedure, we tested many different modeling approaches, and we found um, gradient boosted trees to be the best one. Uh, generally, however, what I would say is that if the data is very simple, I would default to standard methods. If the data is complex, my somewhat controversial take perhaps is to default to machine learning. Um, because these um, tools are just so flexible that uh, they tend to perform better. Uh, if equally powerful, then, then I would go for the simpler approach. Um, and there are, of course, theoretical reasons to do that. But also from a journalistic standpoint, it takes a while to explain your methods. And you have a limited set of attention to work with. So I would rather spend two paragraphs outlaying uh, the implications of my findings uh, rather than going over some complex machine learning tool, um, unless I have to. So uh, going into to machine learning, I'm not sure if this is something you've, you've covered already, um, but um, just to, to give sort of my, my sense of it and how it, I think it can be useful, including in journalistic and visualization work, uh, I see it as a rapidly uh, developing branch of statistics, essentially. Um, and uh, dictionaries define it as techniques which allow computers to generate complex models based on data. Um, so on the slide, you see some um, green dots and some blue or teal dots. Um, now, if you want to uh, separate them, you might ask a machine learning model to do so, and it might do something like draw that black line. Um, and then if another dot appears, the machine learning model will say, well, I think that will be a green dot. This problem seems very simple. And you might think, well, I mean, I could have drawn that line myself, and I mean, might even have done it better. Um, the thing is, this is only two dimensions. Uh, sometimes you have four or 10 or 100. And then this sort of work becomes very um, complicated. Uh, furthermore, now on this slide, you have maybe 40 dots or, or something like that. Uh, if you had 100,000 or 10 million, um, it would be harder um, to, to draw such um, lines between all of them. So you might have something like this, for instance. Um, and if your first instinct when seeing something like this is, I don't want to deal with it, I think this is something for a computer to look at, then um, you are at home in machine learning. Um, and you also, I think, have good instincts. So um, with regards to the uh, machine learning models particular, um, particulars, I should say, um, the input was over 100 statistical indicators. So we were working with over 100 dimensions. Uh, this ranged from demography to um, official COVID data to um, stuff like media freedom, um, the extent of uh, healthcare capacity, um, life expectancies, and so on and so forth, um, to um, geography and um, you know average distance from um, the coast of an average citizen. Um, we then match that to uh, excess deaths data from 84 countries um, where we had it available and used it to predict excess deaths data with uncertainty around it for all countries. Um, uh, and we update these estimates every day. I've also on this slide included the technical details um, of the method. Um, I think we could go into this if you would like, um, but at this time it might be easier just to say that those of you so inclined can go into the GitHub repository and explore the code yourself. We make all our code model and data, models and data 100% um, open source, and we welcome any suggestions for improvements. So we've had multiple people comment. So far, I haven't um, been given any tips that have been sort of, um, I've been given some tips that were a bit confused, and then I've been given some questions, um, but no, no improvements have been made based on public comments so far. Um, so what we did when we had all these estimates is that we combined it with the excess that's data where it is available um, and uh, otherwise used our model estimates. So this is the case of Egypt. As you can see, um, we use our estimates before February of 2020, and then we have known data for some time. And it's worth noting here, look at that gray area and the red line. Um, that is the mismatch in Egypt at the time. Um, so we're talking maybe 20 times. Um, um, with, we're talking excess deaths maybe 20 times the uh, confirmed COVID deaths. 
Um, and then we move up back to model estimates, which are very uncertain because the data available is of, of uh, quite low quality. So the results uh, of all this, I'll just cover in brief. Um, this is the uh, updated estimate as of this morning. Um, we have official COVID deaths at about 4.9 um, something million, uh, whereas we estimate the true death toll to be um, between 10.2 and 19.3 million, with the best guess at 16.6 .6 million. So um, between two and four times uh, what you hear reported uh, is the probable uh, true death toll of the pandemic so far. Um, you can also look at this over time. Um, so here you see the uh, um, that's over time, the official COVID that's in gray and the estimated excess that's in red as usual. Um, what you'll notice is that doing, doing this actually gives a slightly different story of the pandemic. Um, if you had based yourself on the official death tolls, you would have been told a story or you would have been reading a story of waves, um, three waves uh, essentially up until this summer. Um, but those numbers would have been dominated by numbers from Europe uh, and the North America. Now, if you look at the pandemic as it has unfolded all over the world, what you see is just essentially one big wave um, with one exception, which is the catastrophe in India in this spring, which killed um, in all probability millions of people. Um, another thing you will see if you do, do this uh, modeling exercise is a very different incidence of the pandemic. So this would be the map based on official deaths. And if you were to base policy on such a map, you might think, well, uh, I better concentrate my efforts in uh, South America, North America, and Europe, because it appears that the rest of the world hasn't really been hit. Um, you might also think that there has to be something special going on in Southeast Asia, because they appear to have basically no deaths, while the measures to prevent the pandemic has been somewhat limited. Um, that changes if you look at excess deaths. So uh, what you see in this map is that in all probability, many countries, especially uh, in the poor world, have been hit much harder than, than, you, might, than you would expect. Um, and you also have some outliers among countries that are not typically classified as, as poor. Um, and I'm thinking here in particular of Russia. So uh, Russia recently reported 90, 999 official COVID deaths. Um, and it has sort of plateaued around uh, that point for a long time. Um, you might ask yourself why in every single country we have data that we trust, there tends to be waves, whereas in Russia, that's move up to a plateau uh, and then just stay below a certain threshold. Um, some might think that the government have um, an incentive to underplay the severity of the pandemic. And certainly based on excess deaths numbers, that is, you, you certainly um, would believe that deaths in Russia are much worse um, than the government's claim. Now the product on my end, um, this might not be too, too interesting uh, for you, but from a, from a journalistic standpoint, you, uh, if you spend months uh, working on something, you, you better have something to show for it. Um, and so in this case, it was multiple printed pieces, a podcast, video, uh, our daily updated online tracker. And moreover, such a modeling effort is used to inform coverage throughout the publication. So we write about all sorts of countries and we ever, whenever we do so, we refer to the numbers that we have produced. I think that is a major benefit of doing something like this. Um, and as I said, um, the model is completely open, so anyone can build on it and use it in their work. Now, uh, the last part of this talk, I wanted to suggest how all this relates to you. Um, it is pretty abstract, perhaps, to, to think about modeling uh, the pandemic um, as it has unfolded globally, or, or even contacting Google to get mobility data. Um, but I think there are some things that might be useful. Um, and while well, the things I think might be useful to you might not be in reality, um, I'll nevertheless uh, offer them here. Um, so the, the first thing I'll say is that coding and modeling is essentially my work and it is essential um, when we make hiring decisions. Um, so this is from a position that is actually currently open, a data traineeship. Um, and we ask people if they have R or um, Python programming skills, and we expect them to have statistical modeling in the natural, social, or, um, well, from 
uh, natural social or data science. Um, we expect them to know this, not just because they, it enables them to produce such models, but I think more importantly, because it enables people to be critical consumers of them. Um, and that is crucial be, if you are a journalist, but it's also crucial if you are in, in industry or in the public sector. Um, modeling is growing ever more sophisticated. Um, I think it is fair to say that more and more is expected, including in journalism. So we publish detailed methodologies of our work. We do calibration plots. We do, um, well, you know, GitHub repositories and, and, and all that. Um, and we do that because we think this is the way it should be done. Um, and in the process, we're setting an expectation for how it should be done. So if some people might think that they can go into journalism and then have a very rudimentary understanding of modeling and that that will be sufficient. I think that is less and less the case. And I think certainly that more statistics is the direction of travel. I mean, you could look at things like machine learning um, and then how research within that field is just taking off um, and uh, think about all the applications that we've seen so far and all we'll see in the future. That is, in my view, all modeling. And to understand it, I think having a solid coding and modeling background is very useful. Um, I'll also say that programming and methods are useful tools, even for projects that don't have an obvious data angle. Um, so for instance, um, this is the aforementioned piece on beef, or the beef with beef, as we called it. Um, and here you had a story about food, essentially. Um, now, what I wanted to do was to, well, to be, to be completely honest, I had found a couple of new papers that I found uh, quite exciting, and I wanted to share the insights from those papers uh, with our readers. Um, and so what I managed to dig up was the um, carbon emissions from, for different foods. And then it was a matter of not just having those numbers, you know, you could, ex you, you could in theory, have presented just 4.3 um, next to beef, and that would have been it for this piece, but also to visualize it in a way that is both compelling and interesting and also clear to our readers. So here I had excellent help from my colleague, Matt, who is our, uh, was the designer of this piece. Um, and what he suggested was, well, what if we show it in comparison to some things that people might be um, more familiar with? Um, so we elected uh, the country, Japan, and air travel. Uh, and here you see in 10, 2010, uh, the comparative emissions uh, from these different things. And it's quite, um, quite uh, striking, at least to me, to see that beef is more than twice um, all the emissions from rice, um, with rice being, of course, the, a much larger supplier of calories uh, for humans. Um, another thing is uh, election data. Now, election data is, of course, something um, that is very data heavy. And we at The Economist have our presidential model, our Senate model, and so on and so forth. But the field within elections that hasn't been traditionally uh, attacked from a statistical angle by journalists um, is election fraud. Um, now the chart shows the result of um, more than 1 million uh, polling stations in Russia over the past 10 years. And what it shows is um, voter turnout on the x-axis and the su support for the Putin's party or Medvedev, um, or Putin himself, or support for the constitutional reform uh, enabling Putin to remain in power. On a map like this, in a country where elections are free and fair, you would expect a nice cloud shape. Um, there's no reason why numbers should cluster at 80 or 85 or 90. Um, on the flip side, if you are in a country where some results are made up, humans tend to go for round numbers. They just really like them. And so, plotting all these dots on the same chart, you eventually, after reaching, say, three or 400,000 observation, start to see these really clear grid lines. Um, in this case, in the upper right corner, where um, one might suspect that the numbers are uh, made up. Um, and you also curious to see a, a line at 50% turnout, which apparently is something that um, people like. You can also do things like sport. So this was a very simple and quick piece that I did. Um, where I looked at the prodigy Tani, um, who uh, is a New York uh, chess player uh, from, um, uh, from um, Nigeria, uh, who fled to the United States recently and then started playing chess. Um, and this might not look like much of a data story, but it, there's actually a lot here going on. Um, so one thing was getting the data, it wasn't straightforward, it enabled, or it 
required some coding and accessing the United States Chess Federation website. Um, and then we wanted to present it in a compelling way. And one, one thing we had to do was to use a log scale for the years, for instance. Um, another was to pick examples. So I could have just plotted the top 10 players in the United States at present, but I wanted to give some comparison from, from his peers. And so therefore I had both the two people who are ranked above him in his age grade, uh, Andy and Andrew. Um, and you can see how well they are doing uh, compared to him. Now Tani is just continuing to climb as far as I know. So um, someone, someone to follow my friend to chess. Oh, and I, I, I have to mention that this was also picked up by uh, Hikaru Nakamura, the top US chess player, and he played a couple of games with Tani as a result. So that was really nice um, for me at least. Um, this is another thing I did, um, which was a very quick piece uh, done uh, after Trump's Twitter was shut down. Um, and here we're looking at something that has not been, uh, well, it's, it's becoming more and more a thing in, in, in statistics and, and in, in research, but looking at text data. Um, so here I downloaded every single tweet Donald Trump has ever made. Um, and then I analyzed the content for emotion. Um, and what you see is that there was a lot more emotion after he was elected, but in particular, the pre-election tweets were marked by more joy than fear or anger, whereas the post-election ones had, had more fear and anger. Um, I didn't want to sort of, there is, there is a, um, a trap you can fall into, which is to read too much into uh, such data. Um, but I think they are still, they're useful even if, if you don't read too much into them. They, they give a sense of, of more than I think 42,000 tweets or something. Um, and you can summarize it on a small chart like this, which is neat. Um, this is another very different chart um, from, from my research. So some of you might be thinking about going into academia or, or doing um, work in industry. Um, so this is shipping um, with the blue lines showing shipping by propeller propulsion. So primarily now diesel and, and other fuels, um, formerly coal and steamships. Whereas the black lines are uh, travel by wind. I use this to um, look at how trade has changed over time um, because the black lines are, are different in length from the blue lines, even if we're going between the same destinations. So that is sort of an, another approach you can take to data is, is to look at it historically and going very far back in time. So this is from 1600 till uh, today. So I think uh, I'll end there um, and uh, open it up to questions. Um, and um, if there are no questions, then, um, well, let's see if there are any questions. And then if there are no questions, then I can conclude. <clears throat> Thank you very much. That was a truly impressive um, tour de force. And uh, of course I'd failed to also mention in the opening, um, to the students who may not have seen that, that your data team, of course, even came out recently um, and taking a position in the Holy Wars, uh, R or Python, and you know, <laughs> even backed it up with numbers. I think the vote was 14 to 6 uh, to 1 piece, um, pages, so that was very nice. Now, I, I thoroughly enjoyed that, and I um, think this fully delivered what I hoped for and then some, because the emphasis on coding and modeling is um, something that we strongly believe in here too. This particular course is more focused on coding and tooling and not so much the modeling, which other classes um, supply. Um, but uh, I you know, very much enjoyed the glimpses of code that we saw. You know, there was another page that was peace on earth because you transparently moved from a data table read to a tidyverse glimpse. So, you know, the best of breed is really combining the tools for best effect. Uh, so again, very impressive. Thank you very much. Uh, I, think, um, <clears throat> I think the um, GBM stuff behind the modeling is not something we cover here and I'm not so sure it's uh, shown in other classes. There's definitely some, you know, deep learning and other stuff going on, but <clears throat> some of these things, of course, sometimes also, uh, uh, wait for grad school and uh, yes so and but, but what what is what is crucial though is to have the coding skills i think yeah. that really helps um and so the skills that i'm sure your students are learning in this class will enable them to to pick up these tools um whereas you know if you, if you don't have a coding background i don't think it, at least at this point it is possible to do machine learning at, at a, an efficient way yeah. um 
<coughs> yeah, if, yeah, thanks, uh, I fully agreed again. If there are any questions from, uh, from the audience, we can take those now. Um, Miles raised the hand, that's very good. So um, I'll unmute you now, so then uh, uh, you should be able to, uh, to ask. Okay, uh, good afternoon. Um, I just wanted to quickly ask about uh, the Twitter data that you uh, shared with us, the graph for uh, Donald Trump's tweet. Um, on the graph, it said the number of uh, emotion-related words. How did you, uh, what, like, how did you model that data? I was a little bit curious because I did a little bit of symptom analysis, but I never really looked at the total number of uh, emotion words, just the overall emotion of the text. Yeah, sure. Like, no, uh, th uh, thank you, Miles. Yes, I'm happy to answer that. So the, the way that I approached the data was um, to use a dictionary-based approach. Um, so I can't recall the precise library that I use. Um, I, I remember it was an R, um, but essentially that has um, words that are associated with these, these emotions. Um, and I did a simple average of, of how many emotive terms um, there were in each tweet. So that was, that was the approach, nothing more fancy than that. Um, and it's hard to get very fancy with Twitter because the texts are, so, are so short. Sounds cool, thank you. Yeah, no, my pleasure, my pleasure. Yes, uh, Alton. Yeah. Oops, sorry, Alton, I muted you again, go ahead. No worries. Um, thank you very much for the awesome talk. I was wondering how you get your projects. Do you find good data and then you try and tell the story with that? Or does someone come up to you with a question and then you have to track down the data? So bo both happen. Um, sometimes the, the, my editor will, will say, I think we should cover this. Um, are you available um, and interested? And then uh, I might do it. Um, and sometimes I might also help other people. So we are we were doing a big briefing on uh, COVID in Europe. And in that case, I didn't decide on us doing that, um, but I was invited to supply the data for it. Um, and then it's a matter of finding the most relevant data to, to, to investigate the, the topic. Um, I would say for me, uh, in most cases, I find my own projects. Um, and the way that I do it is um, sometimes there's just amazing data um, on a topic that is important. So for instance, in the Russia election story, I came across this graphic um, that was posted by a researcher uh, that I followed for some time. Um, and I felt that this deserved a, a wider audience. I reached out to them and then we uh, was able to produce the piece. But most of, most of the time, I would say that I, I start with um, figuring out what I think it is important to write about. Um, so, uh, for instance, uh, climate is an important issue. Um, I wanted to see what would be the most beneficial way to cover that. Um, and then I started looking for the data. Um, and in the process, I came across these papers that I, I thought were really compelling and I decided to show it. Uh, with regards to the COVID stuff, it is um, the same thing in the sense that um, the story was of course uh, a big one and um, people were interested and, and that enabled me to, to really go into, um, into the weeds on it and, and spend many months modeling, um, which is not something that I think you could do for just about anything. Thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. Yeah, I think you... Um... Yeah, Michael, I think has a question. Yep. Sorry. Oh, do, do you want to? No, nope. go go ahead. Okay. Uh, go ahead, Michael. I can't hear you, Michael. Um, you, you are unmuted according to Zoom. So speak up, Michael, if you can. Or else type it in the chat and we'll uh, we'll read it out from there if uh, if your system is currently fighting with its microphone. We've all been there with our laptops. Yeah, I was, I was just about to pipe in that I've long been a fan of alpha blending for the colors. And I show that in the visualization lectures, but I'd never seen an example as compelling as that one. I mean, of course, how the 5% lines come out there. I mean, this is 
is almost the definition of it that you start with a really faint point and then of course you know they they cluster so clearly on that lines and you know the the data then literally speaks to you out of it i mean that was that was interesting as was the follow-up that then of course afterwards they started randomly mixing fonts and css styles and whatever to make it appear oh yeah, yeah this is this is not machine generated and fake so this is really the yes point. no it's um it's funny that that story i've actually followed for about six years um because i came across the the data early on and then this was of course an update um so i, I came across the their project in, in grad school um and then uh, it was very nice to be able to write about it um and yes i'm a fan of alpha blending it is a pain for the visualizers i think um, because it literally will um, break their software <laughs> if, if the dots get too many. But we managed to do it, so that's good. Oh, Michael, um, what would you say your favorite tool for data analysis is, and where would you say you source most of your data? Um, my favorite tool for data analysis, I would say, is R. Um, that is what I use. Um, within R, I use uh, ggplot a lot. Um, I would say that I'm trying to optimize the communication between the computer and me, and I don't find it very uh, optimized to look at tables. So that's why whenever I work, I probably produce, for a given piece, maybe 100 graphs um, just for my own use. And then that might result in one graph that is um, publicly consumed. Um, with regards to, I, I mean, I also use Python. So I had a big uh, project where we are um, we're providing a tool where you can put in your underlying conditions and age and gender and then figure out your a person's risk for, for COVID death or hospitalization. Um, but that, that was in Python, but I, I use R mostly. With regards to where I get my data, uh, it varies a lot. Um, I think many data journalists tend to get them from government sources, especially if they are um, constrained to a given country. So we see our Britain section using government numbers from Britain quite a lot, which makes sense. Um, with me, it varies tremendously. So um, our world in data, I suppose, is, is one of the big sources that I use. Um, the UN has a lot of the basic stuff, like population, dem dem demography, that kind of thing. Um, and then the OECD and, and the World Bank also have, have data that I use. Um, and then Song Yuan Wang. Um, Thank you uh, for sharing. I uh, see both R and Python recommended. Um, with regards to which programming language is preferred, um, I think that varies. I think you find that most people coming from academia use R, um, especially the social sciences, whereas most people coming from computer science use Python. Um, in industry, I would say that Python is probably uh, mostly used. So if you're doing data science, say, I think. Most people there use Python or other languages, um, but the the separation isn't isn't that great. Um, and if you know R or you know Python, then there is the, the possibility to transition pretty rapidly. I would say. Um, so I had um, I had, for one project I had to use Python, um, and then I I tried to pick it up, uh, and I was able to do so pretty quickly. It is of course annoying going back and forth, but, um, but there isn't. That much of a separation. Yeah. I mean, as the instructor here who's focusing on R in this course, I will also uh, firmly reiterate that more is better. And, you know, Big Tent is better too. We do R here, but sometimes you want Python. As uh, was shown in the talk, sometimes you also want to talk to APIs and fairly orthogonal to which language you use to make a call to a server serving you JSON. Those languages, you know, pick it up. And then at the end of the day, it's most important to get correct and interesting results out in whichever language you uh, you prefer for that, I think is is, uh, is open. Otherwise, I think these, these overall truisms get repeated, but I think stand uh, computer scientists may use more Python than R social and data scientists may use more R than Python, and overall the world user count of Python is higher than an R, and industry is one, one reflection of that, but uh, it's not an either or. So No, no, I, I would agree with that, and I'll also say that, um, I mean, I, 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 I can use both, but I, I personally prefer R. Um, I think it is um, more intuitive. The way, the times I will use Python is if there is an implementation that doesn't exist in R. Um, and that might be for things like I had um, 
uh, a scraper of Instagram that I constructed, or I mean, I tweaked that was based on some previous work that was in Python, so I used Python. Um, yeah, I was but... just about to bring something like that up. So I do a little bit of work with an academic in Quebec on a scraper for Google Trends. And that, of course, is, you know, it's just that. It's a programmatic scraper because Google provides a web page you can hit, but it's not contractual. Um, if they see that your particular domain that you're coming from has overly strong usage, they shut it down. So, you know, half the issue tickets we get at that GitHub repo are people kind of saying, oh, I bombarded it with, you know, bomb bombed it with 10,000 requests. And they said no. And then all we can say is, yep, that's in the terms yeah. of service. So maybe sometimes you just, you just can't. So, you know, also brought a smile to my face when I said earlier in the talk that, yep, we sent Google a letter for uh, you know, requesting the data, but Google you know, interfaces with so many people and gets so much stuff and is so well known for not responding to inquiries coming in that way. So, you know, that happens to everybody, even, even the economists. But then, of course, they came out with the mobility data sets, first it's PDF, then it's CSV, sometimes, sometimes it's there. So, for example, <clears throat> with the tweets and the sentiment, Python early on had a natural language processing library, the name of which I'm now forgetting when R didn't have one. So people would often go over and these days it's often bridged and with tools like Reticulate, particular Python tools are available to the R user and, and vice versa. So, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a good time to work with data because the tooling is just so much better than it used to be. And the data sources are so much better and richer than they, than they used to be. So onwards forwards yes no no for sure and and one of the things that you eventually learn is to um find ways around these rate limits um or um, um some people um i won't mention names might find ways to appear human um, and so access um data uh, at scale um that might not be designed to be accessed at scale um, yes. Uh, hi, Dr. Sosa. May I know if your Trump Twitter project is open source? If so, may I know where I can find it? Thanks. Um, I believe this is uh, open on our GitHub. Um, so I, I don't I, I, I don't know the link off the top of my head, but um, if you go on the Economist at link uh, on GitHub, you might be able to find it. Um, if not, then I can send you the script. Um, no problem. Um, just send me uh, an email or uh, a Twitter message or something like that. Um, I'm new to Twitter, so I don't know how that works, but maybe I need to follow you back or something. It, but. It, yeah, that, that, that should be reconstructable once you have the sources. So the, the packages, as for example, Mike Kearney's R tweet that gets you the text from the tweets uh, in, in, in rich metadata, and then the sentiment libraries do exactly what Sanjay described. They go against calibrated dictionaries that then have weight for particular words. Um, in the tweet, you know, they will not know human irony and sarcasm and what have you, that words can be overloaded, but they, they give them and then you can score them. So that's a, that's a reasonably co common undertaking. I mean, that's been, been, been done before and you should find, you should find support online. So we can, we can take that off to, uh, yeah, to, to, uh, yeah, and I mean, if, if you guys are doing projects, then maybe I shouldn't, uh, I shouldn't share this. No, no, no. Uh, I mean, it's, you it's, it's a, <laughs> I think they're all still digging. It's a it's a worthwhile route to take. Exactly. Now Trump's been done, so onwards to uh, to, to do something similar or, or replicated or updated and, and whatever. Yep. Very good. Yeah. Well, we're coming up to the full hour. I see no hand raised for follow up questions. Nobody's typing in the chat, so I will bow in the general direction of London and give <laughs> you, you a very heartfelt. Thank you once again for uh, spending your time with us. This was this was really most excellent, uh, all three parts of it, and uh, we we really appreciate it. Thank you. No, my my pleasure, and best of luck to to you and and, and to all your students um, in your future endeavors. Um, thank you for having me. <laughs>
uh, Mr. Elliot too. I uh, once uh, DM'd oh, him yeah. many years ago when he was still in Austin before he joined the team. I mean, when he was still, you know, the very precocious um, election blogger that then made him, of course, uh, 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 a data journalist on that team too. So I look forward to his book, which should be in print, I think, next spring, if that's right. Yeah, I think it's coming out soon. I think he has a newsletter and, and, and so on too. I, I'm not too... Yeah, I'm right, following. right. He's, he's prolific. I mean, uh, yeah, that's right. I mean, is, I used to joke about these people that they... Uh, I tend to write faster than I can read, so I think I, uh, you know, I stopped following him directly on, on Twitter. But uh, yeah, I, you know, you, you must be right. I think he had his book leaf earlier in the year, so maybe it's coming out this fall or sort of something like that. I should, I should look for that. Yeah, I, it's, it's hard to keep up. A lot of a lot of our journalists write books, so <laughs> right, that's true too. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So. Well, thank you. I'll head off to dinner. Um, yeah, no, enjoy your night. evening, and I'll uh, shut this one down too. And thank everybody for attending. Thanks again. Yeah. Bye bye.